Welcome into the Pursuit of Manliness podcast, where we're vigorously equipping men to pursue biblical manliness. My name is Jarrett Samuels. I'm the host of the podcast. Men, as always, I want to thank you for taking the time today and checking out today's show. If this is your first time coming across the Pursuit of Manliness, or maybe you've been gone for a little while and you're just circling back, I want to say welcome. I'm thankful you're here. When you get the opportunity, and make sure you check out the pursuit of manliness.com. You can get connected to all things Pursuit of Manliness, get connected to social media accounts, sign up for the email newsletter, see what's available in the gear store, read the latest blog posts. There's constantly something being added there, something being communicated, something that you can engage in. There's two things I want to highlight today before we get into today's guest. Number one, our men's retreat this year is September 30th to October 1st in Indianapolis, Indiana. That retreat sold out last year. We had 154 men register for that retreat. So this year we're doing a couple things different. Number one, uh, the in-person registration is $40. You get the shirt, PVC patch. There's a lot of things that come with that. You can see all those details on the website. So if you want to be in person, if you want to camp out, stay in an RV, sleep in a semi, sleep in your car, get a hotel room, Airbnb, hey man, secure your spot now. Second thing is this, if you want to be a part of the retreat, but you know you physically cannot get to Indianapolis. We had, we had some guys, that was just not an option for them last year for a variety of reasons. Some of them were out of the country. Some of them just had some life things happen. They couldn't make it. Listen, we're offering an online only option this year for you guys so that you get a cheaper rate. This online only option is just $25. You get added to the Facebook community, and that's important because that's where conversations are happening, but that's where all the sessions will be streamed. And I say that because if you can't make it and you know you want to get some guys together at your church, maybe your men's group, you know, two, three weeks later, listen, those sessions will stay in there for months to come. You can play them, watch them, whatever, at your leisure. Or if you want to watch them live when they're happening during the retreat, absolutely. There'll be someone there. You can engage in conversation. So either way, we want to give you the opportunity to be a part of this year's men's retreat. But again, I would sign up as soon as possible. The second thing is this, tribe registration is currently open. We open it up two times a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. And what we do is we give men the opportunity to be a part of this community. We have men all across the U.S. and beyond, into other countries. It is powerful what the Lord is doing in this community. We have high caliber, high quality men. And deep in our soul, we all know that we need that. But I want to encourage you with this. You are that individual as well, and we need you to be a part of a community like this. So go to thepursuitofmanliness.com forward slash tribe, or you can go to the gear store. There's a tribe registration there. Again, there's a lot of information there. So if I just told you a bunch, you're overwhelmed, you're listening to your earbuds, you're driving down the road in your truck, you're in the break room, you're like, man, I ain't got time for that. Listen, they're in the show notes. Or again, go to the website. You'll find all that information. I want to get to this. My guest today is Brant Hansen. Brant Hansen is a radio personality. I first heard him, I believe, back in the day on Way FM in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he wrote the book, The Men We Need. Now, this is a phenomenal book. And I'm going to tell you this. This book is so good that after I read it, actually before I was finished reading it, I had reached out to Brant and reached out to his people and said, how do I get a bulk amount of these books? Because this is the book we are going through in the next session of Tribe. It's practical. Uh, it's applicable. It, you know, it, No matter where you're at as far as being a man, you think you're a manly man or as he says, uh, the avid endorsement. It doesn't matter. This book is for you. It will impact you. It will encourage you and it will resource you up to, again, take care of what God has set before you. We have people in our life. We have resources in our life. And we have opportunities in our life. We want to work and keep what God has given us. Amen. So men, it's time for today's conversation. All right, man, at this time, I want to welcome Brant Hansen to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Brant, thank you for making time and being on today's show. I am honored. Thank you. Well, Brant, you, uh, I, we, we talked just a moment ago. I've, I've known you. I shouldn't say I've known you. I've heard of you for a number of years, been familiar with who you are, your heart. Would you just take a, a brief moment here and introduce yourself before we get into our conversation? Yeah. Um, so my name is Brant. I've been married 32 years. I'm about to become a grandpa any second. Any, it could happen during the podcast. I could like have to leave, uh, um, but I'm excited about that. But I've been in radio for a while. I work with an outfit called Cure International. We have hospitals around the world that serve the poorest of the poor. These are we give surgeries to kids that have correctable disabilities, and it's all done in the name of Jesus, which I really am excited about that expression of who Jesus is. So work with them. Uh, I have my own podcast. I write some books and um, 
Yeah. And uh, my, I got two, two kids are grown up and I'm trying to think what else to tell you. That's about it. I think that's pretty good. <clears throat> All right. I've never had a guest leave because they had, a, if that happens, that'll be, <laughs> this, this will go full post. <laughs> One of the things that I love about your book um, is that you use a mandate that I feel like we overlook and that's Genesis two fifteen that we are, to, we've been, you know, Adam was placed in the garden to work it and to keep it essentially we're to give things better back than we receive it. And you talk about men really early on, you laid that groundwork of just taking responsibility. Could you just share that with us? What happens? What changes when a man begins to own and take some responsibility? Well, okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll answer the that question. I, I would have to say that I'm taking a shot here too, because there's been so much deconstruction in the larger culture, but it's like, as you know, you talk about this all the time. Like, so what does it look like? What's, what's the, what's the beautiful thing? If God's image is male and female, what does that mean? Is it because the both aspects have to be beautiful and profound. Uh, so what is that for men? And that keeper of the garden thing, I think what it looks like, this job that, that Adam was given means that not only do we protect this space and what's within it, we're supposed to, Adam failed to do it and he was called out for it, but it's like, that means that vulnerable species in the garden can thrive, right? Because, I mean, if they're in the wilderness, it's survival of the fittest. There are certain species, we know this, you know, it's plants, animals, whatever, like they're not going to make it. They don't get the sun. But in a garden, you're planning things and ordering things and protecting things and like things that otherwise wouldn't have thrived and flourished get to flourish because you're doing your job. And I really do think that's it. I mean, I, I think women into it. That's when we're at our best. It's like, we're creating this space for the vulnerable to thrive around us. Instead of being a threat to people around us, they're actually feels more secure because we're there. And so it just kind of radiates this sort of security that people are really drawn to. And I think people cross culturally recognize that is actually when men are at their best. And it does completely coincide with, I think this idea of what the, what the keeper of the garden does. You know, we talk often about we're to be, you know, men of presence, you know, we're to add value rather than take it away. And so when a man yes. understands I have value, I have something to give here. I don't have to be the alpha male. I don't have to be the loudest or the, you know, I just need to be present. Right. Totally. And so that's, that's what I'm kind of wanting people to know. I'm not the normal guy to write this book. I mean, if you listen to me on the radio, you, you know that like I play the accordion, I play the flute. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, last time I was on a motorcycle, I'm not kidding. I hit a parked truck and dented it with my face and I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. So that's how slick and cool and manly I am when it comes to some of the stereotypical ideas. Right. But the beauty of it is deeper than that. So if you're not one of those guys, you're not jacked, you're not whatever, you can still do this role. And, and in fact, people will still be drawn to that. Like they respect it intuitively, respect and admire it. And you can be a guy who looks the opposite of the typical superhero or whatever. And, and your wife will find you very attractive because you're embodying this role and you are showing up. You're not passive and you're not domineering, but you're a keeper of the garden. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like in some ways I am the guy to write this book because I'm not the typical I can't hunt. I don't see very well. I have neurological problems. Um, and so like what, you know, I'm not the typical guy to write this book, but in some ways that's really wonderful because uh, it yep. says every, everybody can do this. Yep. Well, that's how we got the name, the pursuit of manliness. I, I knew I had a lot of things I did not possess and I was going to figure some of these things out. <laughs> there's, there's something attractional to humility to say, I mean, I don't know, or I don't need to, Buffalo you into thinking I do know, but here, here's, here's the value I do add, but I have a ton that I can take away. It is, it is. That's, that's a very compelling trait to have. And you know why I think at the deepest level, it's because it radiates security. Mm -hmm. Like the, the ability to be humble makes people feel more secure around you because they feel like you're straight up. Like, and you're not, I, I, there, there, again, there's something really wonderful about a secure man who's not needy. And, and most of us aren't there yet, but it's mm -hmm. a good goal to have to be, I'm, I don't want to be a needy person. And uh, the people around us will flourish when we're not needy. We're able to think about them. Mm. You know, as men, we have a, 
far greater influence and impact than, than we can ever understand or imagine. And, and sometimes it is until years later, until maybe you're a grandfather or until maybe you're looking back on, you have a little more mileage. You wrote this on page 101. You says, my takeaway, you can have a tremendous unseen effect on those around you. You can set the tone, start the melody, and others will sing along. If you think, but man, that's not me. I'm not usually a, a leader. Please know that you absolutely will have this tone setting influence if you have a family. I'd even take it a step further. You have that influence even if you live by yourself, even if you're, hmm. you have it on someone. So how do we start to hmm. embrace that in the appropriate manner? Well, I think a lot of it is going to be about us taking, and I, I mentioned this in one of the decisions I'm saying we should make to set ourselves apart, but one of them is, is what you put your attention on determines who you're becoming. So that is everything. What you pay attention to, and that's not me, that's like a Dallas Willard said that, like it, they, God is very interested in what you're becoming, but that's determined by what you're paying attention to. Think about it like your brain is buying a ticket to attend. You are paying attention and everything is vying for your attention. There is a battle for it, but what you're putting your attention on will determine who you're becoming. So everything's going to start from that in terms of setting a tone. And it, it really does. I mean, I know this personally, it doesn't, it's not like years of, of spending time in scripture or years of praying. Like if I am just conversing with God today and I'm putting my mind on a few things, like I'm trying to memorize a couple of verses or something. It's not, it's not, but that influences the tone of my life that day. And, and outwardly that ripples outward to the people around me. Like we're either sowing chaos or order or security or insecurity with the people around us. It's not a thing where you have to beat yourself up and say, well, I haven't done this for years, so I'll never become this kind of man. Like I'm telling you, it's a real opportunity. Like right now, you can be passionate and honest with God. That you're driving in your car. Even if you have to shut this off for a little bit, like get really honest and, and out loud with God what you're really concerned about. This is the sort of thing that you will draw on it's like a wellspring of life that you'll be able to ask him for wisdom that radiates outward and, and the people will feel, will be more secure because of your inward life. I mean, that that's pretty amazing, but it's true. People around you because of your inward life will benefit from that. And there's something to not needing certain things from people that you're only supposed to get from God, that, that my creator has written his DNA all over me. So I don't need the applause and approval and, and validation of all the, if I walk in a room and not everyone's enamored by my presence, I'm going to be okay because I, I know who I am. And when guys know who they are in their creator, everybody benefits from that. Everyone is oh, totally. safer in that environment. Totally. And there's so many guys, as you know, older than us, unfortunately. And I note this in the book and maybe this is just my opinion. So, but I feel like, there's a lot of guys in their 60s, 70s. We would benefit so much if they weren't still chafing for significance, still trying to be impressive to people. Like, that's ugly at this point. Like, stop it. So, and that's the thing with, like, preachers and sneakers, like that whole phenomenon on Instagram. It's like, I don't care whether somebody wears $1,200 sneakers. I really don't. I mean, that's up to you. I overspend on probably other things or whatever. We, we can. That's not the point. The point is, are these guys still needy? Hmm. Like they have to wear a Gucci belt in front of every, like we are, is that, because that's the problem. That's what hurts. Cause we're hoping that there'll be some people that reach a point just as, just as maturity and, and knowing God that they can draw upon that and not be so needy anymore. And I feel like there's not many guys like that, but I want to become that guy and I'm hmm. working on it. So like, I, I feel like they're kind of missing. Uh, I hate to pick on baby boomers, but the, I, I feel like that's uh, the, the guys like that. Let me put it this way. The guys who are like that, who are other centered and they're not needy are really like stars in the night sky. They're beautiful. <laughs> like, man, we, we, you are wonderful. And you know, what's crazy. You, we know who those people are, right? Like I know for me, when they walk into a room, I'm like, we're good. You know, like it, oh, if, the, yeah, yes. if the trash needs to be taken out or you need to fix the roof, doesn't matter. They'll go either way. They can sit in the back. Absolutely. Like, just know that. And they can, they can listen. Yeah. Like they're not, they don't have to tell you about all that. Well, uh, back to my thing. Like I need to bring you <laughs> under my umbrella. Like what for crying out loud, man, when do you get over that? So I think you're right. So if God is, if I'm actually interacting with him and I haven't always done this very well, I'll be honest. 
but I'm, I'm drawing from that strength. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't, I hate to get all legalistic because people guilted me for years about, well, you need to have a daily quiet time. I'm not talking about daily quiet time. I am mm-hmm. talking about daily being loyal. Yep. Being loyal, even though you're a sinner and you may have done this and that and got caught up in this and that a few hours ago or yesterday or whatever, like still go back to him, still talk to him out loud, still have it out with him. Like that is a strong place to be. But you t- that quiet time, I think we get this idea that we have to have this magical two hour quiet time at 4 a.m. Totally. with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you right now, mine is not that at all. My, you know, and same with my wife. We text, I love you, et cetera, back and forth throughout the day. I'm going to do the same thing with my creator. If I get two great hours of my wife throughout the day and I don't see her again till 4 a.m., that marriage is going to be hanging on by a thread after a while. It has to be continual. We have to be consistent. Yes. And, and I think it's, it's the position of the constant, like interacting about what I'm doing today with God. What are we doing together, God, yeah. today? Like we're partnering. He partners with Abraham. He partners with people in the Bible. Like, would God partner with you? Yes. He's looking for partners. So we talk about what we're doing together today. That's what I'm doing. My quiet time does not look like a meme because every meme of spirituality is somebody silhouetted against the sun. They're either on top of the mountain or they're on the beach. I'm like, those, those, that rarely happens. I don't, I'm not, I'm not on the peak of the mountain very often just in my life. So, but I walk the dog every day. Yeah. So I've been knitting in that, like, that's my trigger. Like, okay, I'm going to actually tell God what I think, what's going on, ask him for stuff, like thank him, yep. but I'm going to do it while I walk the dog. That's all. I love it. Hey, you, may, you tell a story <clears throat> about holding this child in Afghanistan and you talk about the most fragile human that you've ever encountered. Could you, could you just share that, that story with us? I, I don't want to try to read it and mess it up. So. Oh, no, 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 totally. Um, so I heard about cure this hospital network that does these surgeries for, for kids with correctable disabilities and then tells them and their families about God. And they were like, hey, you want to visit our hospital? And I thought I was going to Africa or somewhere. Then they popped it on me. They'd be in Afghanistan. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, but I loved it. And I went there three times, actually. The first time I was there, they said, hey, would you do kangaroo duty? And I'm like, kangaroo duty? I've never been in a hospital like this. What the heck is kangaroo duty? Well, I said, sure, thinking I'd be hopping or something. I don't know what. But I was in a uh, neonatal intensive care unit. And kangaroo duty is these little tiny babies are premature, need someone to like hold them next to their skin. So they handed me a one pound human being, one pound. And I held her. She had no name because she had no likelihood of living. So they didn't want to name their daughter. They didn't really have much to do with her. So she's got no family, no nothing, no name. And it's just one pound. Like, so I held this tiny living thing next to my chest. I like just, just the top couple buttons on my shirt and just held her there. And she would look up at me and I could see her eyes looking at me, but she didn't weigh anything. Like it fit in one hand. So I was left there for a couple hours, I think it was. And I, I was in a rocking chair. It was just me and her. And I just had to be quiet and still. But. I was thinking a lot of stuff as we were looking at each other. But one of the things I was thinking is in God's economy, this, she's a girl in Afghanistan. Okay. That alone puts her at the bottom. She's already sick. She's premature. She has no name, not a social security number, of course, no status, no, no evidence that she's even alive, basically no record, no nothing. No money, no prestige, no Instagram account, no nothing. And in God's economy, she's royalty. Like, as I thought about that, how vulnerable this person is, and that she's, lo- she's royalty in God's economy, honestly, it made me love God more. I honestly could say, it, it, saying I love God has never just tripped off my tongue easily, or I love Jesus. Some people, it comes off easily, but for me, it's, been, it's taken time. But that's one of the things I really love about him. Like that he would value this little scrap of life 
like that more than like we value celebrity. She has no, none of that. But I think that's really cool. And I, I think it, it's, there's something about a God like that that makes me want to serve him and be a part of a kingdom that operates that way. And it's, it's interesting if you take the other side of the coin that we're talking about is how often we chase value and prestige and verified and, and all these other things that we would say of value here on the, on the planet. And right there in your, your, your hand, it's the, as much as my coffee weighs, is someone that God says, no, that's, that's the most important thing on, the, on this planet right now. Totally. Well, I want to go all in on that. That's what I was thinking. I'm, I'm growing in that. But I like that a lot. And, and also the way he keeps saying in scripture, I don't talk about this that much in the book, but the way he keeps saying in scripture, like if you've done something for them, you've done something for me. There's even a proverb that says, if you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay you. So he's so identified. This is his love language, apparently. Like that's what he, he wants us to love people and serve people who can't do a thing for us. They can't do a thing. Because the only reason we would do that is because we love him. Everybody else can do something for us, including even, in, even our wives or other people get, give us good feelings or our kids. Well, that's great. But how about if it's serving or sacrificing for somebody that can't return a thing? They have nothing to offer you. The only reason you do that is because you're worshiping God. And he clearly makes that his love language. One of the reasons why I think we, we struggle with this, this genuinely loving God, like you just talk about quoting scripture and you talk about just seeing him in these different un, unforeseen places, this divine appointment to hold this child and then ultimately to tell the story. And we're you know sharing it again. We're so distracted. We're so consumed by so many things and screens and monitors and alerts and whatever. And you, you give a story of taking some kids on a mission trip in Mexico and yeah. you asked a great question like, Hey, how many of you guys were you know struggling with porn this week or lust or whatever? And they're like, yeah, we're, we're exhausted, right? You filled your time and your mind with something that was fruitful. Could you share that with us? Yeah, uh, I think it's really good news because we can we, all of us can be tempted. We're always even if it's not a live addiction, it's a temptation. Like there's all that we could get into this stuff. And then I remember talking to the high schoolers in my youth group, and these there were certain guys you have camaraderie with, you know, and they're kind of disciples and. But the, the number one issue was lust and pornography. I mean, that they were struggling with. And the, the weird thing was when we went on this mission trip, I just happened to ask, it was at the end of a week where we had been working all day long. It was 110 degrees. We were building, we were mixing our own cement by hand, all that sort of stuff. It was exhausting. And then, and then we, you know, you don't get a shower. We were camping in the desert and it was a big mess. Um, and there were girls on the trip too, but I asked the guys, Hey, so just curious, you've been struggling with loss this week. And it, it, it hit him like, like, Whoa, what? No, actually we've been so busy and we're tired and we've had so many laughs and we've had, you know, we've been hanging out with each other. Like I, I, I say that to tell guys too, a lot of our temptations and struggles come from the way we structure our days. And if we just restructure you put yourself in a position where it's not as big an issue because you're too busy. But if you're isolated and you've got a lot of time on your hands, man, that's, that's a lot of the problem. So I, I say that actually as good news. Like if you change, if you, ch you have to have the means to make this different kind of life work, but a lot of times it's just changing life circumstances so that it's less of an issue. And I, I think I, I've, I've not only found that to be true, but I know a lot of people who have. Yeah. It's when you, get tired or you, your pride takes a hit. You quote C.S. Lewis who said, you know, hell starts with a mood, right? Yeah. So to do totally. this, we've we got to start changing our moods. We've got to start changing our approach. Yeah. And, and this, this is really good. So I, I think just restructuring things really important too. And, and Lewis makes that point that you brought up and I love it. And that is even when you're young, you need to be asking for wisdom because wisdom will, will tell you what's important and what's not. That's, that's my kind of operational definition for it, is it tells you the relative value of things. This matters, this doesn't, or this matters more, this matters less. This is very important early on, because you start this trajectory, and that's what Lewis was talking about in The Great Divorce. He's like, originally, you can just be a grumble when you're, yeah, you grumble some when you're 20, you're 22, you're compl you complain a little bit, you complain. But if you don't check that, you just become a grumble over time. 
And then you're like a machine that just grumbles on into eternity. That's all you are is a grumble. Like, so I, I'm trying to tell, uh, advise people who are a little bit younger to say, you've got to watch little attitudes and things like that now, because if you're one degree off, if you, if you have a moon launch and you're one degree off, you'll miss the moon by 4,100 miles. And you're on a trajectory, you're becoming something. And this is why you see a lot of older guys that, are, that become caricatures and cartoons. They're like so angry or so whatever. But what happened was they were younger. It didn't happen overnight. But when they were younger, they didn't check some of that stuff and they just become this caricature. And the same thing can happen for us to be more peaceful and more loving, more joyful. We can become that guy too, who's at an older level who looks, who looks like a, a saint. And we, we know some of those people, you know, there's that old, older guy in your church or neighborhood that you're like, I just love being around that individual. Well, that didn't happen yes. because he retired. It happened because right. he developed this over <laughs> his life. Right. Right. So I'm trying to like the, the guy at the grocery store that hits you with a shopping cart or the lady. <laughs> I always want to ask them and you can't do this, but I always do want to ask. Have you always been angry? Have you always been angry or did that? Cause it's not just now. It's there's there's something that's been building over time, yeah. and we are we are responsible for that. I mean, you can even see it. it people wear it on their faces. Yeah. You can even see peaceful people by the time they're eighty years old versus angry. Like you wear it. I I think it's I think some of it's disappointment. You chase something in life that you were never going to get instead of finding your identity and in, in what you were created to do, right? Yes. And I, I mentioned that as one of the decisions too, it's uh, be ambitious about the right things. And that's the wisdom piece because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that look back with regret or they have to double down on their, their own foolishness, but foolishness always causes pain. That's why I'm like, pray for wisdom. One major pain for a lot of guys is they lacked wisdom when they had little kids in the house or teenagers. And instead of seeing this as a season to focus on them and, and, do whatever they have to economically or whatever to clear space so that you can have time with your kids. Instead, it's like, I have to have this truck. Mm -hmm. I have to make the payments on this really nice house. I have to, well, then you have to, you look back with regret. Why did I do that? Mm -hmm. And you, that's a lot of pain. And so it's, it's only loving, I think, to advise guys to go, no, no, no. And I'm, I'm literally telling them, look, if you think, but I've got to have this nice house. You can live in a trailer. You can. I know it's like it's like high heresy to say I have lived I, in one. I like, have too. <laughs> okay, good. Right. All right. So you're from first, Iowa. First place. From yeah. Small town, Illinois. We've done this, and you know what? It's okay. And it's, you don't have to drive a new truck. You can drive right. an '86 Corolla. Yeah. It's okay. What are you, James Bond? You got to have an Aston Martin. Like who? Right. Right now, it's kid season. It's not car season. While you have the kids, and it's not going to last forever. It's a short period. Mm -hmm. But if it means no vacation, who cares? Get a hose, hook it up to a sprinkler, <laughs> call it a water park outside your trailer and play with your trailer kids and laugh and enjoy them and cook some burgers, man. Like, so what? Get the car later on. I'm trying to tell guys, be ambitious about the right things. And then you don't have to look back with regret. And wisdom is the thing that will help you do that. Absolutely. You talk about um, three things, circumstances, schedules, and people, how essential this is. So just how, how are these three tethered together? What, what do we do to start changing our circumstances, our, our schedules and people? Yeah, I, 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 I'm really big on, on guys uh, get like forcing yourself to have commitments to get out of the house. This is a big deal for younger guys. And there, there's actually a phenomenon called a hikikomori. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's in Japan, but it's, it's shut-ins. They're willingly shutting themselves in. And it's by the millions around the world, young guys who are, whose entire experience is virtual. So they live maybe in their parents' home. They don't work or they work only online and they, they do their pornography and video games and that's it. And they don't leave. But the ethos is, at least in the West, the ethos is, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, what's it matter? And I'm saying to guys, guess what? You are hurting people. And when I do that, I'm hurting people because God gave you a purpose and gifts and abilities. He didn't give anybody else. 
and you're in a context nobody else is, and you're not showing up. There's people that could have benefited from you making the neighborhood safer, making things better. Like I get to work with these, these little kids that need surgeries. I just use my words to help. I'm not a doctor, but hey, I get to do that. I found a way to try to be a blessing and add value to their lives, like as you put it. Um, so really trying to help them realize like you do have a purpose and there are real consequences for you not showing up. There's maybe a woman who could have benefited who's pining for a man who could have, that would have been you if you would have grown up like a real world person that would have benefited. Same thing with who knows what you wind up doing, like who, who winds up being a, you'd be a blessing to, but you have to actually have commitments outside that force you to leave, to do other things. And you don't want to look back at age 70 and go, all I did was sit around. You just, nobody does. Well, at some point, the gravy train is going to pass on. You, you can't live in your parents' house forever. I would think at some point you look at the ceiling and go, what am I doing? Like, yeah, this is not existing. You hope that. And, and you know what's <laughs> funny? In Japan, they literally, the government, I'm not making this up. They literally hired cheerleaders, like girl cheerleaders, to go door to door to certain addresses to try to coax guys to come out and get a job. I'm not making this up. That sounds really weird, but like you do need somebody to knock on your door to go, Hey, we need you out here. We actually do. We actually like, it, you, there's real consequences and there's real blessings that come from you actually taking the risk of relationships. For instance, I know it's easier and it's more, you get more of a dopamine hit from pornography and you get more of a dopamine hit from gaming. I understand that life doesn't work that way, but it's way better. The only poetry you have in life is from making commitments. Otherwise, there's no poetry to life, but you've, you've got to do it to experience it. It takes a little bit of bravery, but let's do it. Man, and you only get one shot at this thing. You only get one right. opportunity. Yeah. I, 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 I said that too, with regard to the back to the kids thing, like, man, you want to work 16 hours a day, be a big shot lawyer, whatever you want to do, but you got kids at home. They had one shot at a dad. Yep. One shot. I, t I say that with respect to dads too. Like I have a, cha a chapter on should you shelter your kids? And my answer is yes. Yes, that's your job. Right. Yes, it is. And over time, of course, you give them more and more freedom and you want, you want to release them into adulthood as fully formed adults, but as much as you can. But yeah, you shelter them. They have one, one dad. Mm -hmm. This is their, like, they only have you. They get one childhood. They only get one shot at childhood. Yes, protect that. Protect that childhood. So, yeah, anyway, that's a little bit of a, a tangent, but Amen. yeah, you get one shot. A a Amen. And you don't get to decide how they remember you. It's amazing your kids. Uh, some of my kids' favorite memories are putting a tent out in the backyard. And I'm like, you still remember like that? We had no money. We had no money. That was camping out for that's us. That's totally man. So, it. So we said, that's, that's totally what it. <laughs> that was the one thing I think I mentioned in the book that, like, of all the dumb things I've done and foolish things I've done, this. This financial thing where I actually passed up what would have been a very lucrative, demanding thing because I would basically be saying goodbye. Mm. And instead, I took a job that paid nothing. And I worked while well, I was done at noon or one every day. Mm. And we had moved mm. to South Florida. We had no money at all. It was, I drove, we had one garbage car and it was a family of four. And my wife stayed at home. She homeschooled kids. But every afternoon, man, swimming pool, community pool, or we went to the beach every afternoon for years. And my kids, and that was, I got that decision right. Right. Like now I can work all the time. They're gone. I can work, 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 travel, travel, like, you know, travel with my wife mainly. But it's like, I got time now. So why would I have to, I'm so glad I took a pass on doing this stuff then. So, and yeah. less regrets. And no less regrets. regrets. <laughs> right. Yes. No, at least, <laughs> at least on that, at least on that. Yeah. Right. Less, less right. regrets. But no, on that decision, I nailed it. Right. That's why I'm, I'm so emphatic about it. Like this is the, this is maybe the one big thing I got right. Right. I did. Right. I did not mess that one up. It, my wife stayed home for years and we had nothing. And we had the little card. We got the free milk and juice and we drank our yes. juice and milk. And hey, 
that state of Illinois paid for our first two kids. We made no money, but we're like, Hey, we're raising Dude, our kids. <laughs> we're living the same life. You and yeah. I, like we did, we had the WIC program in Illinois yeah, yeah. too. Where, where did you live in Illinois? I lived in uh, Salem, Illinois. So it's right. Uh, Southern Illinois, Effingham, it Effingham and Carbondale. So, yep. yeah, I know exactly where it is off 57. I know where you that's are. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we had an Applebee's in town. If we really, really were going to splurge, we got curbside to go on Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, and now looking back, it, you know what, man? God bless my wife for the, all that. St- I mean, God just took care of us. And we, man, we just, whatever, yes, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He made it work. That's right. He made it work. And those are sweet memories. So, oh, yeah. I mean, we, we, we shouldn't be able to be opinionated about that and tell guys that, like, that this this is a this is a kid season move. This is a family season move. They need you, not stressed out all the time, enjoying them, having some time, all that. Well, we talk about because we have <clears throat> high school daughters now, so there's more moving pieces. And we say, hey, we parent different. That doesn't mean we're better. It means we're doing some things different, and we're gonna we're gonna approach some things differently. Again, sure. I will tell me, hey, someday you may look back and say, hey, I don't like that or I would have done it. That's great. And now you're in a place where you're able to see the fruit of your labor of why you did some of the things that you did, right? Totally. Uh, I'm very thankful. And things, you know this too, things can go haywire and it like you don't control your kids. Right. But once they're, they're, they're individuals, I will say though, I know them. Yeah. And they know mm, me. That's good. I will say that. And on paper, I could impress, like, they're awesome. And I love them as adults. We, st- I still, we, st- we laugh and laugh and laugh. And that's, that's coming on the strength of all of those afternoons, I think. Well, I, I want to begin to wrap up with this and I mean this as a compliment. So please, um, I, I am not a big fan of Christian radio. And so I need to preface it with that. I'm so <laughs> thankful. I'm so thankful for you because Thank you. you speak truth uh the way you speak resonates with i don't i don't drive around the minivan with my kids in the back drinking frappuccinos running to target so the way that you speak uh, resonates with me i thank you for doing that we need more guys on radio who are gonna just be honest man i mean just be thank you you know and thank you for I, from back in the day when i first heard you i was like okay i i dig this 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 works for me so thank you for doing that You're thank welcome. you for writing thank this you. book filled with post notes you. How do we get in touch with you where you're on social media, your book, where do guys go to find more about you? Well, uh, at, at Brant Hansen on Twitter, I guess, but, or Brant Hansen page on Facebook, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's branthansen.com is my website. Uh, and the book's available anywhere, like all the usual places, uh, Amazon and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but um, yeah. And if anybody wants to shoot me an email, or whatever the thoughts on the book or something. It's just brand at brandhanson.com. And I've just said my name like eight times in the last 20 seconds. That's very embarrassing, but that is my email address. It's brand at brandhanson.com. You got to hear the intro to this thing, the pursuit of manliness. It's like 60 times, you know, they have to say that. So I, I get it. It's like, <laughs> y'all get it, man. So, Hey, Hey brother, thank you for making time. I know you got a lot of life moving around. This book is fantastic. We're going to get it in the hands of a bunch of guys across the globe. Awesome. Thank you for doing what you're doing. My pleasure. God bless you. Once again, man, thank you for listening to or watching the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. If you would, make sure you subscribe. Share this conversation with whoever you think could benefit from it. And again, go check out thepursuitofmanliness.com. Find out about the retreat. Find out about Tribe. Secure your spot, man. We need guys like you to be a part of these communities. Amen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Let's keep pursuing biblical manliness.